share my RSVP info in case his. Welcome and thank you for standing by. At this time, all participants are in listen only mode until the question and answer session of today's conference. At that time, you may press star 1 on your phone to ask a question. I'd like to inform all parties that today's conference is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. I would now like to turn the conference over to Lieutenant Simons. Thank you. You may begin. Um, good afternoon and welcome to the technical assistance webinar for the FY 2019 funding opportunity announcement preventing HIV infection in women through expanded intimate partner violence prevention screening and response services. I'm Lieutenant Dantrell Simmons and I will serve as the project officer um, on, on this project and Brittany Parati will serve as the evaluation lead. Um, for our OWH leadership members, we uh, include Dr. Beth Collins Sharp who is the Director of the Division of Program Innovation, and Dr. Dor and Dr. Dorothy Fink, who is also the Director of OWH, as well as the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Women's Health. In addition, we also have Dr. Scott Moore, who is the Director of the Office of Grants Management. The objectives of this technical assistance webinar are to discuss the vision, mission, and goals of, the, of OWH, uh, we will also review the FOA, including the purpose, eligibility, and how to apply. In addition, we will address questions related to the FOA. Now I'll turn it over to Dr. Fink, who will go over the mission, vision, and goals of the office. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, our Office on Women's Health is very pleased to have you on the call today. Our office's vision is that all women and girls achieve the best possible health. And through this, our mission is to provide national leadership and coordination to improve the health of women and girls through policy, education, and innovative programs. And so through this, we have four main goals, to inform and influence policies, educate the public, educate professionals, as well as developing and expanding innovative approaches. You can check out our website at womenshealth.gov and girlshealth.gov. All right, thank you, Dr. Fink. Now we will briefly hear from Dr. Beth Collins Short, who will discuss the history of our office with both IPV and HIV. Good afternoon, everyone. We, have, we do have a history of working on both topics individually and um, collectively. So we have a history of partnering with the Department of Health and Human Services Violence Against Women Steering Committee and the National HIV AIDS Strategy Work Group. The result of these collaborations and our work have resulted in several resources. The most recent, uh, which is, will be uh, finishing up rather soon, is the IPV Provider Network, engaging the healthcare provider response to interpersonal violence against women. This is our most recent grant program. We've had a continuous grant funding since 2010, and the, this particular grant grew out of the previous grant um, called Project Connect, where we identified the importance of having a connection and then um, a health services response to uh, between clinical providers and domestic violence providers. We have also produced an HIV prevention toolkit, which is taking a gender responsive approach and a cross learning training and collaboration guide in domestic violence and HIV. These intersectional products are old, however, they are seminal and we keep them on our website for that reason. We also have a signature uh, celebration, which is National Women's and Girls HIV AIDS Awareness Day, or NAGAD for short, which is celebrated each March 10th. And then finally, in the HIV realm, we worked on projects on HIV in older women, and uh, the most recent uh, activity in this regard is uh, regarding HIV is the article that is listed here in the Journal of HIV, uh, which is currently in press, but available online. So we have a number of initiatives that are coming together nicely to lead up to this FOA. All right, thanks Dr. Colin Short. So the estimated funds available for this FOA is 3.1 million. We anticipate funding between two to five recipients. Funding ranges from 500,000 through 
$1,033,333 per budget year. The anticipated start date is July 1st, 2019. The award is for two years and each budget period is 12 months. This award is a cooperative agreement. Applicants should, be, should submit electronically via grants.gov only unless an exemption is granted. Responses to the FOA are due June 12, 2019 by 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. The two overarching goals for this FOA, um, goal one is to support victims and survivors to lessen harms after experiencing IPV, including activities that aim to prevent HIV transmission, increasing HIV screening, and improve access to services for individuals with newly acquired HIV infection. Goal two is to promote social norms that protect against IPV. These goals recognize the role that social norms play in contributing to cycles of gender-based violence and the need for comprehensive, patient-centered, and trauma-informed care for affected women. This FOA seeks applicants capable of providing a community-level focus to the, uh, to the prevention, screening, and response to IPV and its intersection with the risk um, of HIV infection. Violence against women continues to affect millions of women and girls each year. Studies show that women who have experienced IPV in the last year were nearly 3.5 times as likely as women, uh, more likely as women who have not experienced IPV to have an HIV diagnosis. According to the National Intimate Partner and Sexual Violence Survey, IPV is defined as sexual violence, stalking, physical violence, psychological aggression, and or control of reproductive or sexual health perpetrated by an intimate partner who is described as a romantic or sexual partner. For this FOA, applicants are to address two key components of the Stop Sexual Violence Technical Package. This technical package was developed by CDC to present um, a core set of uh, strategies to achieve and sustain prevention activities with the greatest potential to reduce sexual violence. The required components of the FOA um, are to promote social norms that protect against violence, support victims and survivors to lessen the harm. Additional information about the STOP SV package will be provided later in this presentation. Um, in February of 2019, the President and Secretary for HHS announced the end, Ending HIV Epidemic, a plan for America. Uh, the link could be found in the FOA. This multi-year program aims to reduce um, new HIV infection by 75% in five years. A key strategy of this in initiative is to protect people at risk for HIV. In an effort to support this initiative, the OWH co um, Cooperative Agreement will target local communities with high prevalence rates of both HIV and IPV, where women are most at risk for contracting HIV as demonstrated through the community needs assessment. Applicants should provide documentation of how they will address the focus area and build on the existing knowledge base in this area. Projects will be based on a community needs assessment that will be used to inform planning, implementation, and evaluation efforts, and to assist in identifying relative risk and protective factors for IPV and HIV. Crucial services and partners need, uh, needed by their target population and indicators of successful program outcomes. As previously mentioned, the FOA is a cooperative agreement. A cooperative agreement is an award instrument of financial assistance where the program office anticipates substantial programmatic involvement with the recipient during performance of the project or activity. Such activities include uh, providing prior approval for change of time that key personnel other than the project director or principal investigator are dedicated to the project um, and replacement of key uh, personnel. Key personnel includes any position that supports day-to-day -day project management in addition to the project director, such as project manager and project coordinator. The local evaluator is uh, considered a key, um, central and key role for the project and will be the direct communication with the pro program staff on the par with other key personnel. Providing guidance and support in the design and development of the project, including but not limited to the integration of gender-based approaches and the design of activities aligned with the STOP SV technical package. 
consulting with um, awardees to support the design questions and success measures for recipient local evaluation and establishing common measures to be collected by all project teams. In addition, we'll serve as a resource to provide programmatic evaluation support during the program, having frequent communication with the project officer, project manager, evaluation leads to discuss progress and consult on next steps, participating in the pre uh, preparation of publications and public presentation of the data obtained under this cooperative agreement, and consult with awardees throughout the preparation and dissemination, dissemination of materials related to this uh, project. Review of recipient progress during the planning period and agreement to move forward to with full implementation. Um, um, and lastly, reviewing of the design questions and success measures for recipient evaluation. Um, the components of this application include the narrative, the budget narrative, um, project narrative, um, problem statement, goals and objectives. Again, the goals of this particular FOA are to support victims and survivors to lessen harms after experiencing IPV, including activities that aim to prevent HIV transmission, increasing HIV screening, and improve access to services for individuals with newly acquired HIV infection, and go to promote social norms that protect against IPV. Um, the program plan should be clearly stated, indicating how the applicant will address the problems or issues identified in the community needs assessment. Identify the role of the makeup and makeup of potential partners and, if applicable, sub-recipients, including the level of um, effort for each partner uh, slash sub-recipient. The applicant should include specific details of the intervention strategies, expected outcomes, and barriers for each year of the award, this FOA focuses on the intersection of IPV and HIV among women and girls. The target population should be explicitly justified by the community needs assessment. Um, now, Brittany will provide um, information on the evaluation as well as the STOP SV technical package. Hi, everyone. We have included requirements related to the STOP SV technical package developed by the CDC because this. Uh, this technical package includes programs, practices, and policies with evidence of impact on both individual and environmental factors related to sexual violence. For the purposes of this project, we have decided to focus on prevention strategies that will address social norms in the community, such as traditional gender role norms, social norms supportive of violence, and male sexual entitlement through primary prevention activities and to support women with past experience of violence to prevent further violence victimization. We selected these strategies to address risk factors for the various overlapping forms of intimate partner violence experienced by women, including but not limited to sexual violence, which has been linked to low rates of condom use and increased risk of HIV, and physical violence toward HIV positive individuals, as well as the cyclical nature of these forms of abuse. Prevention activities will be rooted in approaches linked to the Stop SV technical package strategies of promoting social norms that protect against violence. These approaches will work towards potential outcomes such as reductions in the acceptability of intimate partner violence, increases in recognition of abusive behavior towards others, uh, including individuals who experience abuse in connection to their HIV positive status, and increases in favorable, favorable beliefs towards safe communities. Additionally, response activities will be rooted in the Stop SV strategy of supporting victim survivors to lessen the harms they experience, including increased risk of HIV infection. These approaches will work towards potential outcomes such as reductions in short and long-term negative effects of IPV victimization, including HIV infection, and improvements in access to services for IPV survivors. We encourage applicants to not only include the two required strategies, but to also consider applying approaches contained within the other Stop SV strategies as appropriate for their programming community. Uh, and now I'll talk a little bit about the evaluation plan requirements. So your uh, summary of the proposed evaluation plan included in your application uh, should include the items detailed here on the screen, which are also included in the FOA. 
but as an overview, grantees will report both on common measures that are established at the start of the program uh, by OWH based on the Stop SB strategies and other agency reporting requirements, uh, as well as uh, establish local evaluation plans. Given that not all programs, practices, and policies are effective across all populations, we are seeking applicants who can appropriately select and tailor the STOP SV programs based on community needs assessments and then evaluate the implementation and outcomes of these models in the communities in which they are implemented. Thus, local evaluation is also required. All right. So in addition to the um, the aforementioned um, sections, additional sections to the application include the dissemination of findings from OWH funded work, which will contribute to broader public health practice, a sustainability plan, an organizational uh, capability statement, which should identify the capabilities of the applicant organization, uh, previous work with IPV, HIV, or public health issues that involve significant collaboration or integration across different systems or sectors of health and human service. In addition, the applicants should provide supporting documents that include letters of, letters of commitment and documented experience of obtaining IRB approval in a timely manner. In terms of scoring criteria, there are four care, um, criteria. Um, factor one is understanding the problem in the priority community, that's 20 points. Factor two, technical approach and work plan, which is 35 points. Factor three, evaluation and performance measurement, 10 points. Um, factor four, organizational uh, capabilities, project management experience, that's 35 points. Now I will turn it over to Dr. Scott Moore, who will discuss um, grant management activities. Um, operator, if um, Scott is on the line, can um, you get him in the uh, webinar, please? Yes, one moment. Right now, I do not see him on there. Scott, if you're on the line, hit star zero, please. All right, we'll go ahead and um, uh, present his uh, slides, and as soon as he's able to join, um, because he is listening, he is able to hear, and so we'll present the slides, and um, he can add to those as he needs to when we're able to uh, join him in. All right. So the application is due by 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on June 12, 2019. Um, your submission time will be determined by the date and time stamp provided by grants.gov when you complete your submission. Strongly encourage um, applicants. Is that you, Dr. Moore? This is Scott. Yes, hello. Thank you. Hi. Thank you very much. Sorry for the technical difficulty. Um, I am Scott Moore. I'm from the Office of Grants Management. Um, my office handles the business and the administrative side of the, of the grants. Um, it's a little dry, um, but it's some very important information that everyone needs to know going into the application process. Um, first and foremost, the most important thing to know are our submission dates and times. Your application is due by 6 p.m. Eastern Time on June 12, 2019. That is a firm, fixed deadline. Your, your submission time will be determined by the date and time stamp provided by grants.gov when you complete your submission. We strongly encourage you, in fact, we emphatically strongly encourage you to submit your application a, a minimum of three to five days prior to the application closing date. This is because grants.gov may take up to 48 hours to notify you of a successful submission. We want you to have a second chance of submitting if something technically goes wrong. If you fail to submit your application by the due date and time, understand that we will not review it and it will receive no further consideration. Next slide, please. So, eligible applicants, as described in the FOA on page 19, are any public or private nonprofit entity located in a state, which includes one of the 50 states, the District of Columbia, the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico, U.S. Virgin Islands, 
Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands, American Samoa, Guam, Republic of Palau, Federated States of Micronesia, and the Republic of the Marshall Islands. Anyone in any public or private nonprofit entity in any of those locations is eligible to apply for an award under this announcement. Faith-based organizations and American Indian, Alaska Native, and Native American organizations are also eligible to apply. Next slide. So boiling that down, some examples uh, would include state governments, county governments, city or township governments, Native American tribal governments, federally or state recognized, community and faith-based nonprofit organizations, nonprofits having 501c3 status with the IRS, public, state-controlled, and private nonprofit institutions for higher education, and other nonprofit school districts or entities. For this particular FOA, you are not required to provide cost-sharing or matching in your proposal budget. So the, you'll hear us reference the FOA, the Funding Opportunity Announcement, throughout. Um, it provides information and guidance related to the application process. Please re read the entire funding announcement. Um, follow the announcement very carefully. The information provided in the FOA is going to take precedence over any <coughs> information in any other documents. To request the application package, you may obtain it through grants.gov. Um, this is electronic means. Um, you find it by searching for the CFDA number provided on page one of the FOA. Uh, for this particular um, FOA, the CFDA number is 93.088. And we strongly encourage you on grants.gov to, to subscribe to this announcement so you receive notification of any updates to the FOA or supporting documents. This is extremely important with this particular announcement. We have had to make some typographical updates and also updates for points of contact. So it's very important to subscribe to the updates. As far as application submission goes, OAS requires that all applications be submitted electronically via grants.gov unless an exemption has been granted. If you submit an application via any other electronic communication, such as email, it will not be accepted for review. It must come through grants.gov. Um, you can access grants.gov through www.grants.gov. All funding opportunities and grant application packages for OASH are made available through this site. An application will not be considered valid until all application components are entered into grants.gov and received by our office, the Office of Grants Management, according <coughs> to the deadline specified in the date section of page one of the FOA. And that date, again, is determined by the time and date stamp that grants.gov receives it. Should you have technical issues or problems uploading into grants.gov, please do not call the Office of Grants Management or the OWH Program Office. Grants.gov is a system that we use that's provided to us through contract. They are the technical experts. Their contact information is listed all over their website, and we provide their phone number here. So for technical issues, for faster service, contact grants.gov directly. Next slide. So the application should be or must be submitted as three separate files. The first. Uh, first upload is the entire project narrative. The second upload, the entire budget narrative, including supporting documentation as described in the budget narrative content section of the FOA. The third upload should be all documents in the appendices uploaded in the attachment section as a single acceptable file. Please combine your appendices into a single file. Um, if they come in as multiple files, um, you, you run the risk of them not being in the order that you want them in or not being, if you're over the page limit, not having the ones go forward that you want to go forward. Uh, so please put them in as a single acceptable file. Some exceptions um, is that the required standard forms do not apply to the submission requirement as stated in the disqualification criteria. So your standard forms are not going to go against your page limits. 
You can tell a government standard form because our federal forms start with SF for standard form if it's a standard form. Next slide, please. Any files uploaded or attached to the grants.gov application must be in one of the file, following file formats, Microsoft Word, Excel, or PowerPoint, Adobe PDF, or the standard image formats, JPEG, GIF, TIFF, or bitmap. Those are the only four image formats that are acceptable, JPEG, GIF, TIFF, and bitmap. Our office strongly recommends that electronic applications be uploaded as Adobe PDF whenever possible. If you convert to a PDF document prior to submission, you may prevent any unintentional formatting changes that might occur with the submission of an editable document. Your application please be complete and do not leave blanks on forums unless the information is clearly not applicable. And very important, the individual submitting the application for your organization uh, must have the legal authority to do so and to act on behalf of the organization. To ensure a successful submission of your application, carefully follow the step-by-step -step instructions provided on the grants.gov website. The link is provided here. These instructions are kept up to date and also provide links to frequently asked questions and other troubleshooting information as well as the contact information if you're having technical difficulties with which you need assistance. Next slide. So the actual elements of an application, and these are provided on the FOA at pages 67 to 68. Uh, the first four are standard forms because they all start with SF, and that would be our application for federal assistance, the budget information for non-construction programs, assurances for non-construction programs, and disclosure of lobbying activities. These four forms do not count against your page count. Also part of the application, your project abstract summary, your project narrative, which should be submitted as a single acceptable file, your budget narrative and supporting documents, which are also um, should be submitted as a single acceptable file, and then of course your appendices, which we again ask for a single acceptable file. Be sure to follow the project narrative format instructions in your FOA. Your application will be disqualified if it does not conform to the format requirements. You must double space the project narrative pages. You must use a 12 point font. You should use an easily readable typeface, such as Times New Roman or Arial. You may single space tables or use alternate fonts, but you must ensure that the tables are easy to read. For appendices and the budget narrative, you should use the same formatting specified in the project narrative. However, for some appendix documents, such as resumes, <coughs> use formats that are common to such documents. To apply for an award and for your, your application to be accepted in grants.gov, um, you must be registered in the system for award management. Grants.gov will reject submissions from applicants with non-existent or expired SAM registrations. If you are registering as a new entity in SAM.gov, this is a paper process, you're going to have to use the mail. And you're going to mail the Entity Administrator Notarized Letter to the Federal Service Desk, desk Attention SAM.gov Registration Processing. Your notarized letter with the details required must be mailed. Your registration will not be activated until the letter is submitted and reviewed. The minimum time frame to complete an initial SAM registration can be 30 minutes, but the time frame for an applicant's registration to become active is up to 10 days. Please factor these timelines in when you're looking, uh, when you're preparing uh, for your submission. SAM registration must be renewed each year. I also want to emphasize that failures to have an active SAM registration prior to the application due date will not be grounds for receiving an exemption to the electronic submission requirement. Next slide. So SAM is a separate system from grants.gov. The average time frame for the systems to update um, re relative to each other is 72 hours. So that's another three days to budget into your timing. 
We recommend applicants check active registration in SAM well before the application deadline. If you are successful and receive an award, you must maintain an active SAM registration with current information at all times during the active award. If you have not complied with these requirements, OASH may determine you are not qualified to receive an award and may use that determination as a basis for making an award to another applicant. Should you successfully compete and receive an award, all first-tier subaward recipients must have a DUNS number at the time you make the subaward to them. When working on your budget, your direct expenses must be allowable, allocable, and reasonable and necessary for the proposed project. Indirect costs may be charged on OS, OS grants in accordance with the department regulations and current policy effective at the time of the award. The current requirements can be found online in our regulation 45 CFR part 75 for the uniform administrative requirements, cost principles, and audit requirements for HHS awards. Indirect costs may be included per the regulation Applicants should indicate which method or rate is used for this particular application. Current salary limitations were recently updated um, and re retroactively effective to January 2019 with a cap of 192,300. So the project budget um, it includes the standard form 424A budget form, the budget narrative, and a detailed budget justification. Your budget must be consistent with the requirements of the FOA. Budget and costs must reflect the proposed activities in your application. Forms, narrative, and detailed justification do not count towards your page limit uh, with respect to the budget. Budget line item descriptions and justification requirements are all explained in the FOA and we include some sample table formats in the FOA as well to help you in preparing your budgets. Next page. So, um, application disqualification criteria. Your application will be disqualified if it is not submitted electronically by a grants.gov by the due date and time, unless an exemption was granted two, days, two business days prior to that deadline. Um, the process for request, requesting such an exemption is in the FOA. If you successfully submit multiple applications for the same project, we will review only the last application received by the deadline. It's the Office of Grants Management that deems your application eligible. Again, the project narrative must be double-spaced on the equivalent of 8.5 by 11 uh, page size with one inch margins on all sides and font size not less than 12 points. We'd like our reviewers to be able to read and evaluate your application. The application also needs to meet the application responsiveness criteria described in the FOA. Next slide. Um, the award ceiling for this particular FOA is 1 million $33,333. Uh, this is the maximum for the budget period, the first budget period, um, which is typically 12 months. Uh, the award floor is $500,000. Um, other disqualification criteria um, relate to page limits. Your project narrative should not or may not exceed 25 pages, and your total app application, including project narrative plus the appendices, cannot exceed 50 pages. Next slide, please. Applications that um, are not disqualified but lack the required supporting documentation or submit additional appendix files are not disqualified from competitive review, however, um, the, la the lack of these, doc uh, these documents may impact your application scoring under the evaluation criteria. 
So the moral of the story is be sure to follow the submission instructions very, very carefully. Now, eligible applications will be reviewed and scored by a panel of independent reviewers with technical expertise in the applicable fields according to the criteria listed in the program announcement. The objective review committee process is formal and confidential. Federal staff are available to the reviewers for questions and to ensure the process is consistent and fair, but we do not participate in discussion and scoring. The applications are reviewed by OGM staff for administrative and business compliance and by the program office staff for programmatic compliance. Following the, the objective review, it's the Deputy Assistant Secretary on Women's Health um, who will take into consideration the following uh, community and setting specific elements, uh, clearly defined target population, epidemiological data, demographic data, and geographic region or specific community. And it is the Deputy Assistant Secretary who will make recommendations for funding to me, the Grants Management Officer, uh, where my office will then begin conducting a risk analysis. Please understand during the funding process, we are not obligated to make any federal award as a result of this announcement. It's only the grants officer that can bind the federal government to the expenditure of funds. If at any point during the process, particularly the risk analysis process, you receive communications to negotiate an award or request additional or clarifying information, this does not mean you will receive an award. It only means that your application is still under consideration. All award decisions, including the level of funding, if an award is made, are final and you may not appeal. I've mentioned the risk analysis, but exactly what is it? Um, well, OASH will evaluate each application in the fundable range for risks posed by the applicant before issuing an award in accordance with our regulation, 45 CFR uh, Part 75. OAS uses a risk-based approach and may consider any items, such as the following as stated in the FOA, your financial stability, quality of management systems and ability to meet the management standards prescribed in the reg, your history of performance, um, particularly in the management of federal awards, including timeliness of compliance with applicable recording, reporting requirements, conformance to the terms and conditions um, of previous federal awards. Um, we will also consider reports and findings from audits that have been performed and also your ability to effectively implement statutory, regulatory, or other requirements imposed on non-federal entities. When it comes time to make an award and issue an award, we do that through the Notice of Award or the NOA. The NOA notifies the successful applicant of the selection. This comes from the Office of Grants Management. Um, it includes the award amount, the project, and budget periods. The NOA includes any conditions of the award, for example, any requirements that must be met as a condition of receiving grant funds. It also includes standard terms, reporting requirements, and contact information for both uh, the grants management specialist and the program office. In the event that we do not make an award to you because we determine that your organization does not meet either or both of the minimum qualification standards as described in the regulation, we must report that de determination to FAPIS, <coughs> to FAPIS. Um, at a minimum. If you are a prior federal award recipient, information in the system must indicate that your organization demonstrates a satisfactory record of executing programs or activities under federal grants cooperative agreements or procurement awards, and integrity and business, business ethics. This information will then be available for other organizations to review when considering you for an award. The Office of Grants Management is the official contact for the grantee. All official communication related to the grant is between OGM and the successful applicant. 
but it is the program office who will notify unsuccessful applicants by a letter. All right, thank you, Dr. Moore. <clears throat> so at this time, we will begin with um, answering questions, um, but we did receive a few questions via email that we'll address first. Um, just note that we'll try our best to answer any questions at this time. However, however, if we don't have a response right now, we'll provide an FAQ um, that will complement the FOA. So the first question that I have, are adolescents in this target population, can we submit for adolescents, youth adults, um, ages 14 through 22? So the response is the age range is not limited for this FOA, the applicant should provide evidence to support a focus on the target population through the community needs assessment. In addition, the applicant should provide evidence that they can both recruit and retain the target population established in the community needs assessment. Um, the second question, the FOA indicates that the proposed programs should be grounded in a community needs assessment. <clears throat> In order to identify a target population and available community resources to inform the project, it also lists a community needs assessment as the key component of the project. Is the community needs assessment an activity that should be conducted before the RFP is submitted, or is it expected and required grant deliverable that takes place post-award? So our response, the community needs assessment should be completed as part of the application in order to identify the target population. Um, the community needs assessment uh, will serve as a baseline and will then guide the post-award activities such as planning, implementation, and evaluation. <clears throat> so question three, do you have expectations in terms of minimums or appropriate ranges for the number of clients to be reached annually through this FOA. A specific number is not required and can be based on the available population in the community needs assessment. However, sufficient numbers will become important in the evaluation phase since awardees will be evaluating the implementation and effectiveness of a, a multi-sectoral um, community level violence prevention, screening, and response intervention. The applicant should identify the number of individuals served, under, um, served in this application and provide evidence that the agency can recruit and retain the number of individuals specified. Um, oversampling is suggested to account for participants who discontinue. Um, question four, if we have a standing letter of commitment renewed annually with our partnering agencies, may we submit this letter for the FOA or should, we, uh, should letters be specific to the R FOA, even if the activities take place around direct services and coordination, which will be the same. <clears throat> you may submit the annual letter if it uh, specifies the required information in the FOA. Namely, these signed letters of commitment must detail the specific role and resources um, that will be provided or activities that will be undertaken in support of the applicant. The letter of commitment should also describe the organizational expertise, experience, and access to the population served. Okay. Dustin, at this time, you can also open the line up for additional questions. Thank you. We would now like to open the phone lines for any questions. If anyone does have a question, please hit star 1 and record your name when prompted. Again, that's star 1 to ask a question. One moment to see if we have questions on the phone. We do have one question on the phone from April Swinehart. Your line is open. 
Hi, yes. Um, during the webinar, you mentioned local evaluators and lead evaluators, and I was just what, asking if you could clarify between those two in reference to the evaluation of the project itself. Hi, thanks for your question. This is Brittany Parati. So I'm serving as the lead evaluator for OWH on the project. So when we refer to the lead evaluator, that's me. And when we say local evaluator, we're referring to uh, the key personnel who are required member of your team uh, as you propose uh, within your application. Do you have a follow-up question to that? No, that's perfect. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Next, we have Rebecca. Your line is open. Is that me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. Sorry. Thank you. Um, so my question was, so in the FOA, it says that the total application is not to exceed 25 pages. And in the presentation, there was a mention of 50 pages. And I just wanted to make sure that the 25 pages, I know it's for the project narrative, but does that also include the appendices, or is that a separate 25 pages? Hi, Rebecca. Thank you for your question. Um, so the, the information that provided in the FOA is the correct information. The FOA that is on grants.gov has also been um, updated as well. So it should be the 25 pages for the project narrative and for um, the complete application that exceeds 50 pages. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Next, we have Abby Arnold. Your line is open. Thank you so much. I have a question about the evaluation component. Um, often with DHS, uh, DHHS um, uh, grants, there's an expectation that we have an outside evaluator and that uh, typically about 20% of the budget goes to that entity. Is that the model that you're expecting for this, uh, this uh, competition as well? OWH requires a local evaluator within the, this FOA, which may be internal or external to your organization, although we do encourage you to use best practices within evaluation and to assess the capabilities of staff within your organization uh, when making the determination of whether or not that key personnel should be external or internal, uh, as well as how much of your budget would be required to fully fulfill the uh, evaluation requirements within the FOA. Thank you. Thank you. Again, if there are any questions on the phone, please use star one. And as of right now, I'm showing no questions on the phone. Okay. Hold on one second. It looks like we have a couple coming in. I have Robin. Your line is open. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my question is about the um, the project um, supporting victims and survivors to lessen harms um, regarding the HIV strategies that we would use. Um, would you allow other CDC effective interventions for HIV prevention um, to count toward that required activity? We're seeking strategies that align with the best practices described in the Stop SV technical package. And so if you're able to demonstrate how your proposed activities align with the suggested strategies, then that will be taken into consideration in the review of your application. Great, thank you. Thank you. Next we have Anisha Gandhi. Your line is open. Hi, thank you, um, and apologies if you already answered this. Um, we uh, just were able to connect, but I wondered if this, um, if this opportunity applies both to cisgender and transgender women or if it focuses exclusively on cisgender women. 
there's no limitation uh, regarding gender for this FOA. Great, thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Dina Williams. Your line is open. Thank you. Uh, my question was answered. Um, I was asking the same question around uh, male to female population. So I got answered. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Williams. Stella Billings, your line is open. Hi. Would you be able to provide more guidance around um, documentation with experience um, for the IRB approval process? One of the primary concerns with IRB processes is the length of time that it takes. Um, so uh, experience with an IRB uh, with this type of activity, um, which um, has an efficient uh, process, would um, be important uh, information. Um, if I may ask a clarification question, um, if we aren't partnering with a research institution but have extensive experience conducting evaluation internally and therefore do not have a formal IRB process, um, would documentation still be required? It would still be required to provide evidence that you have the experience and the ability to go through the IRB process as may be required to uh, conduct the evaluation given the subject matter and target population of this project. I wonder if Dr. Moore has anything to add because I believe this is a requirement for all grants. Sorry, could you repeat the question? They're asking about uh, sites that don't, ha that don't have um, access to a formal IRB, um, and if, but if they have uh, extensive experience in evaluation, would they still need an IRB um, approval, a traditional IRB approval? Um, the, the short answer is yes. Um, it, the, the prime awardee is going to be responsible for the, the IRB for the entire project, um, and the subawardees would still also, consistent with the, the new common rule as it's been, been rolled out. Thank you. Next, we have Brenda Cruz. Your line is open. Hi, thank you. My question was I wanted to see if you can please define what a partner or subrecipient is. Um, in general, a subrecipient is going to be somebody that you are delegating part of the programmatic or the project function to. Um, generally through um, a, a, some sort of subaward or subcontract, um, where a partner is a little bit looser term um, that will typically involve a subawardee or a subcontract, but not always. Um, Can I ask a follow-up question? Sure. Okay, so for, because I understand you need letters of, you're only reviewing letters of commitment. So for, so for a partner not receiving a portion of the award financially, you would still require a letter of commitment? We want to see that? If their, their contribution to the project is enabling the project to complete its function or its purpose, yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And again, if there are any questions on the phone, please use star one. We have Tiffany Conroy. Your line is open. Yeah, uh, just a question related to the community needs assessment. I'm curious if that needs to be a document that is uh, developed and in implemented specific to this project or if we're able to use previously administered assessments such as a community health needs assessment or a con consumer needs assessment through Ryan White HIV programs. Yes, the community needs assessment could have been previously con conducted as long as it is current and continues to be relevant to the target population that you intend to serve. And 
I'd like to add while we're discussing the community needs assessment and target population, going back to the previous question about uh, how we identify women within the context of this SOA, that uh, regardless of uh, gender identity, we want to ensure that you clearly define the target population that you're referring to when you are sharing your uh, results of your community needs assessment within your application. So please uh, be clear if there is a large you know, trans population or otherwise that you are serving that will be a specific focus of your project and, and clearly identify that population. Great, thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Anisha Gande again. Your line is open. Um, thank you. I think one of my questions just got answered. Um, it sounds like we can use prior needs assessments. The other question I had was whether, um, and apologies if this was covered, if you, um, if you could speak a little bit more to the interdisciplinarity that, um, that is required, if we, um, if it, the types of service organizations that can be involved as community partners, and also wanted to confirm that we should be naming the types of community partners, but specific organizations or agencies that we are working with can be named post-award. Given that MOUs are required for partners who are going to, or letters, sorry, I'm sorry, letters of commitment are required for formal partnerships that so will be a part of this initiative, then specific entities would need to be identified prior to award. Uh, however, we do describe within the FOA a broad variety of uh, potential partners who could be included in order to support multi-sectoral efforts across systems where your target population is receiving services. Uh, those are suggested uh, types of partnering organizations, but that list is not comprehensive and we recognize that you may identify other partners as well. Great, thanks so much. Operator, do we have any additional questions? Yes, we have Ms. Kleindis, your line is open. Hi there, I was wondering if, um, if an agency that's a non-direct service agency, but a 501c3, can they apply as the lead agency in partnership with uh, more direct service agencies? Yes. Thank you, and Barbara Cruz, your line is open. Okay, yes, thank you. Can you please clarify how many years is considered current for a community needs assessment? Internally. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. For just one moment, we're gonna discuss internally. Oh, sure, no problem. Okay, we're back. Um, so um, your community needs assessment should be based on um, the, the most recent surveillance data provided. Okay, um, but what would you recommend in terms of other, in other data? Would you say three years maximum in terms of, I'm not, Give us one sec to confirm here.
So usually um, surveillance data are captured every two years, but if you're capturing data from um, locally, um, you can include that, but also provide a rationale for why you're using that data or if it hasn't been updated at a certain point. Our greatest concern is that the data that you provide is going to sufficiently explain the target population that you've selected as well as the risk and protective factors that are relevant to that population. And so it needs to be recent enough that it provides a sound justification for your approaches that you have included within the work plan and project narrative. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Next we have Ashton Gatewood. Your line is open. Yes, thank you. Sorry, I wanted to address that the FOA um, stated that 12, um, 12 months is the recommended time period to complete um, program um, implementation. However, the funding can be used for up to a two-year period. Is there a certain um, implementation goals or preferences or requirements for a project to exceed the 12 months into 24 months? Dr. Moore, do you want to talk about budget periods? So um, the, the budget period um, is awarded on a year-by-year -year basis. Um, so the, the initial award is for 12 months. Um, for the budget period. Um, any subsequent uh, funding um, is going to be contingent upon um, a continuation application demonstrating satisfactory uh, uh, performance uh, during the, pri the previous period. Um, so there is no guarantee uh, that the second year would receive funding. Um, so that, that that's how the budget is broken up um, over the entire project period, which would be up to two years. As far as um, you know, the other part of your question, that's a programmatic um, issue, and I'll let that one go back to the program office. Well, the preference is stated um, in, in the FOA as um, the activities um, occurring in the first year, and so that is the preference. And again, if there are any questions on the phone, please use star one. Since it sounds like we may not have any other questions, I just want to add in light of the question, in light of the questions that we have received related to the community needs assessment as well as evaluation, that the data that you have available to you as part of your community needs assessment is intended to serve as a baseline for your evaluation. And so if it is not within the 12 months prior to the program starting, then you should include in your plans your uh, how you will identify more uh, a, a better baseline for your evaluation or a more recent baseline for your evaluation, I should say, um, that is an extension of that community needs assessment. So please do indicate how, uh, what data will serve as your baseline for your evaluation as part of the summary of your evaluation plan. And keep in mind that we would like to see outcome data as part of that evaluation. And so if activities are planned to be implemented during the first year, then evaluation activities could then continue into the second year, assuming continuation of the award.
And I am still showing no questions on the phone. Okay. Well, thank you all for participating in today's call. If you have any questions related to um, programmatic requirements, you can contact me at dantrell.simmons at hhs.gov. If you have any questions related to administrative and budgetary requirements, you can come, uh, contact Amanda Osborne at amanda.osborne at hhs.gov. Um, so thank you guys for your time, and we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for participating in today's conference. You may disconnect your line and have a great day or a great evening. Speakers, please wait for post-conference.